Welcome everyone, I think it's five to so we'll make a start to this, the second public lecture of our programme to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the hand of CSWB, the inelegantly titled Centre for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence here in the School of International Relations at St Andrews. Over the 25 years that it has existed, one of the abiding research strengths, one might say one of the healthy obsessions of the CSPB tradition of studying terrorism, has been the question of how liberal democracies do, and how liberal democracies should respond to the challenge of terrorist atrocity, and how they should do so whilst remaining firmly within both the spirit and the letter of the law within the confines of what the Germans call the Reichstaat, the state that operates bound by the rule of law. And yet, I think it's fair to say that very often how laws are made, one thinks of Bismarck's famous phrase, the two things you don't want to see being made are sausages and laws, uh, and how they actually operate, how the legal system actually in a liberal democracy deals with the threat of terrorism, tends to be uh, or tends to remain in rather softer conceptual focus for those of us who are not on the inside of the business. And here we need specialist guides. Fortunately, tonight, we have a very specialist guide indeed. A Theseus, so to speak, to guide us through the legal labyrinth in the shape of our speaker, Richard Whittam. Put simply, but with no exaggeration, Richard is one of the United Kingdom's absolute top specialist criminal practitioners with expertise in the most complex and high profile criminal cases of recent years. Qualifying or being called to the bar as the term is in 1983, he has since carved out a reputation for his forensic court craft on both the defense and prosecution side. Whilst keeping up his own practice, he's worked very closely with government uh, until November 2015, for instance, he was the first senior Treasury counsel dealing with complex fraud cases. And it is no accident at all that he has been called upon to prosecute in several of the most high-profile and notorious terrorist-related cases, two of which uh, he will speak about tonight. His professional achievements include becoming a QC or Queen's Counsel, a silk, that is, for those of you not familiar with English law, a senior barrister appointed on the recommendation of the Lord Chancellor in 2008, a recorder in 2009, essentially a circuit judge, I understand it, and a deputy high court judge in 2016. Perhaps most importantly of all, he has been awarded Crime Silk of the Year in both 2016 and 2018. With his legal precision, he will no doubt correct me, but I understand this in layman's terms as being essentially the equivalent of being voted Premier League Footballer of the Year by the other footballers. So we are in very good hands indeed tonight. The format will be that Richard will speak for the best part of an hour. His chosen title is Terrorist Murder. Note the scare quotes. Um, not up on the board, but Terrorist mo Murder. Uh, the cases of Adebolajo and Adebowale. Uh, in other words, the murderers of Lee Rigby, if you remember that case, and Thomas Mayer, the murderer of Joe Cox, contrasted. There'll then be a chance for you to hone your cross-examination skills on Richard in a question and answer session. Um, just so you know the format, we do record these lectures uh, so that we can put them on the web and get some attention for the center, but we don't record questions and answer sessions, so that's to sort of encourage your participation. Uh, and we'll break at about 6.30 or so. So that essentially uh, brings me to the end of my introduction. Richard, thank you so much for your generosity of time, making the long haul north. Welcome to St. Andrews and over to you. I'm not sure whether on that introduction it means that I'm saved by the embarrassment of not being able to answer your questions, that they're not recorded, uh, but we'll see. The very public murder of a man aged 25 in 2013, adjacent to the barracks in Woolwich in the Royal Borough of Greenwich, and the murder of a woman aged 41 in 2016 in Burstall in Yorkshire, are examples of 
killing strangers, how violence became modern. Lee Rigby was selected as a random soldier who would be murdered in public for maximum effect, and the perpetrators sought to revel in the shocking nature of their act to attract attention. Joe Cox was a serving member of parliament. She was not personally acquainted to her murderer, but she was targeted as an individual because of what she stood for. They were deeds to gain propaganda, action to support their ideas. Both sought that oxygen of publicity. In dealing with comparing them, I'm going to deal with how they were tried, a little bit of the facts for those of you who are not so familiar with them, and things that unfolded thereafter. It, it, introducing the case to the jury, it was important to explain that they should put emotion to one side. Uh, deliberately, I used the same paragraphs in both cases. The circumstances of this death are shocking. It's important you do not let emotion or sympathy affect your judgment in this case. The prosecution seeks only true verdicts on the evidence as you find it to be. Nothing more and nothing less. That is a bedrock principle of our system of trial by jury. Juries up and down the country apply that principle week in, week out in defendants in their charge. It will be your task to consider the evidence you hear and decide the case in accordance with the law as directed by his lordship. In order to do so, you need to operate as a team, 12 of you together, and apply cool logic and sound common sense. To some extent, particularly the murderers of Lee Rigby, sought to test the legal system. No defence. They weren't going to plead. There was a forlorn attempt to say it wasn't within the Queen's peace. That will be something for a different lecture. But Adibolajo was always going to give evidence and always going to say, yes, that's me on the video, attempting to decapitate Lee Rigby because he wanted a publicity, a stand for what he stood for. But you still had to bring the case home. You still had to prove it on the evidence, despite any defence that might be advanced. Thomas Mayer was slightly different. He had no defence. He didn't really articulate one. He just sat in the dock and was never going to give evidence. I was commenting um, just before uh, we started uh, that the silk Simon Russell Flint defending him did it as well as he could in the circumstances. It was the speech that I remember being delivered the most slowly that I can recall. It's quite how long you can spin out the burden of proof. I think he got it to about 14 minutes before he expired. The um, case of Lee Rigby was prosecuted at the Central Criminal Court, the Old Bailey, because far-right groups in Woolwich sought to take political advantage of the murder, and it would have been prejudicial to the fair trial of the defendants had the trial taken place at the Crown Court sitting at Woolwich. Murders within the Metropolitan Borough of London fall within the jurisdiction of the Central Criminal Court in any event. People in London have a general understanding of where Woolwich is and its environs. Well, what was the case, just in a little detail, but in summary? Shortly after two o'clock on Wednesday, the 22nd of May, 2013, in Artillery Place in the Royal Borough of Greenwich, two men drove a Vauxhall Tigra car straight at Fusilier Lee Rigby as he walked across the road. The car struck him from behind. It was travelling at something like 30 to 40 miles an hour. From the eyewitness accounts, it appears that Lee Rigby 
was rendered unconscious by that deliberate act. The car carried him from the road onto the pavement. There is no evidence to suggest that the driver of the Tigra braked at any stage and it struck a stanchion of a road sign with great force. Such was the damage to the vehicle that the impact had made it difficult for the passenger to even open the front seat before he got out to attack. Both men did get out, clearly acting together with a common purpose. The initial impression from some of the members of the public was that it had been an accident. It was not. They were armed with a meat cleaver and knives. Later they were to take up a firearm, a revolver. They both attacked the motionless body of Lee Rigby. He was repeatedly stabbed, and Michael Adabalajo made a serious and almost successful attempt to decapitate him with multiple blows to his neck with the meat cleaver. At the same time uh, as he was doing that, Michael Adabawale was using a knife to stab and cut at his body. Both men then dragged Lee Rigby's body into the middle of the road. They wanted the members of the public present to see the consequences of their barbarous acts. They had committed a cowardly and callous murder by deliberately attacking an unarmed man in civilian clothes from behind using a vehicle as a weapon and then they murdered and mutilated his body. Such heinous behaviour is a distinct contrast to the bravery and decency shown by some of the members of the public present. Despite the abhorrence of the scene, that one woman went to the lifeless body of Lee Rigby and stroked him and provided some comfort and humanity to what had unfolded. Others went to see if they could provide first aid. Another woman engaged Michael Adabalajo in conversation, despite the fact he was still holding the meat cleaver and his hands were covered in blood. The use of the firearm was part of the plan. It wasn't an effective firearm, but it was to frighten off members of the public that came towards them. It was also so that when the emergency services arrived, they could look as though they were going to shoot them. A police vehicle swung into artillery place and stopped in the middle of the road. Both men immediately moved towards it, Michael Adabalajo more directly and with more speed than his co-defendant. That may have been because he had the meat cleaver and to use it he had to get into bodily contact. He got very close and he raised it and was about to make contact with the woman that was driving the police vehicle. Fortunately, the firearms officer in the back of the car had the window open and he had his carbine lying across his legs and he fired and hit him. The duties of firearms officers change in an instant. They're entitled to use lethal force if there is a danger to life, as there clearly was here. Together, having shot both men, the firearms officers immediately had to render first aid to them in an attempt to save their lives, and they did so without hesitation. <coughs> You'll have to recall that this was deliberately done in public for maximum effect and many people recorded parts of it on their mobile phones. What of Joe Cox? Thomas Mayer was brought to London by counter-terrorism officers. Therefore he went to Westminster Magistrates Court and was committed to stand his trial too at the Central Criminal Court. <coughs> I happened to come from the north of England on the other side of the Pennines but at precisely the same latitude. <coughs> Whilst the rivalry remains between the two roses, there's a unity in sharing a great suspicion of the South. Deliberately, I went to Burstall. I walked the route that Thomas Mayer took. I went to the marketplace. I learnt where the co-op, the pub and the curry house were. I saw the bus stop where he dismounted from the bus and was recognised. Why? These cases command huge public interest and widespread and immediate reporting. 
Despite being tried in London, it was important that those in Bristol and the surrounding areas didn't feel disenfranchised <coughs> by the fact that the trial was taking place in London. Uh, and uh, the introduction to that jury was this. The case is concerned with the events that took place in Market Street in Bristol near Batley, Kirklees, on Thursday the 16th of June this year. Bristol is just south of Bradford and Leeds and just north of Huddersfield and Wakefield. It's all but 200 miles from this court. By dint of our criminal justice system, the case is being tried here at the Central Criminal Court. Despite that, you will become familiar with the marketplace in Bristol. It lies between Low Lane and Chapel Lane. A statue of Joseph Priestley proudly stands there. He was born in Bristol in 1733. He achieved many great things and significantly he believed in the open exchange of ideas and advocated toleration and equal rights. In the general election held on the 7th of May 2015, Joe Cox was elected as the Member of Parliament for Batley and Spen. Burstall lies within her constituency. She was aged 40 at the time of her election, having been born on the 22nd of June of 1974. She accepted her mandate to represent her constituents with enthusiasm and regularly held surgeries throughout her constituency. She was well known as a hard-working Member of Parliament and mother of two young children. In her maiden speech in the House of Commons on the 3rd of June of 2015, she spoke of her joy at representing a diverse community. She proclaimed her pride at being made in Yorkshire. Tragically, she died in Yorkshire before the end of the following year. The United Kingdom European membership referendum was to be held on the 23rd of June of 2016. Joe Cox supported the Remain campaign. On this day, she was to hold a surgery in the library on Market Street, just off from the Market Square. Earlier in the day, she'd visited a local school and a care home. As she arrived, she was brutally murdered by one of her constituents, Thomas Mayer. It was a cowardly attack by a man armed with a firearm and a knife. Joe Cox was shot three times and suffered multiple stab wounds. During the course of the murder, Thomas Mayer was heard by a number of witnesses to say repeatedly, Britain first. In the course of the sustained attack on her, a 77-year-old local man risked his own life in an effort to save hers. In the course of his brave intervention, he was stabbed once by the defendant with the same knife that he'd used to stab Joe Cox. Every effort was made to save her life. The emergency services arrived within minutes. Her injuries were such that an emergency thoracotomy was performed as she lay in the street. The murder took place while she was performing her role as a member of parliament. Thomas Mayer's intention was to kill her in what was a pre-planned and premeditated murder for political and or ideological course. The use of a firearm, a .22 weapon that he had adapted to be used to kill. He also used a dagger-like knife. What was the relevance of those words? Well, despite what the press said, there is no such thing as an offence of terrorist murder. There's an offence of murder in particular circumstances that aggravate it. And Schedule 21 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003 sets out the starting point for uh, sentences after somebody's been convicted of murder and courts have to take the schedule into account. The court considers the seriousness of the offence uh, and if it considers it is exceptionally high and the offenders over 21, which they both were, the appropriate starting point is a whole life order. For those uh, unfamiliar with our sentencing process, for murder, you're sentenced to life, but uh, after you've served a determinate period, you're released uh, and you remain uh, on parole or on licence for the rest of your life. It, 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 we introduced a whole life term in, in the
the kind of terms we're talking about in 2003. And a whole life term it can be appropriate when a murder is done for the purpose of advancing a political, religious, racial or ideological cause. I pause there. There was a, a considerable litigation as to whether it was compatible uh, with the European Convention rights to sentence somebody to die in prison without any prospect of being released. Uh, uh, Lord Thomas um, presided over that appeal uh, and decided that whole life terms were lawful. The only exception there might be is out of clemency at the very end of the person's life that uh, the Home Secretary might allow you to be released. He said in that authority that it was something to be sparingly used. I think I've now dealt with five cases where uh, the convicted defendant received a whole life term. Uh, and uh, Adi Bellagio and Thomas Mayer both did. Equally, though, having um, explained that, that that's what might get you a, a whole life term, you will know that the Terrorism Act 2000 uh, um, says what terrorism is. The use or threat of action. The use or threat is designed to influence the government or an international government or governmental organisation or to intimidate the public or a section of the public. And the use or threat is made for the purpose of advancing a political, religious, racial or ideological cause. Well, identical really to Schedule 21. Clearly, they both qualify. Adi Bellagio, having carried out his barbarous acts, was shouting, you can record me or take pictures. This is for your government to realise about Muslims. These soldiers go to our land, kill and bomb our people, so an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Somebody said, are you going to hurt us? No, women are children safe. You need to keep back for when the police and the soldiers get here. And then, as I've said, the police did arrive and shot him. Please let me lie here. I don't want anyone to die. I just want the soldiers out of my country. Your government is all wrong. I did it for my God. I wish the bullets had killed me so I can join my friends and family. I want to thank the person who shot me. Allah gave me this arm and you can do what you want with it. Thomas Mayer, as I've uh, indicated during the course of uh, the attack, was heard to say, Britain first. Britain will always come first. We're British. Independence. Keep Britain independent and make Britain independent. Days before the referendum, it, it was uh, clear that that too fell within both definitions. How are terrorist cases prosecuted? Well, there is a protocol called the Management of Terrorist Cases. It has, rather like the title of this lecture, has terrorism cases in quote marks. Why? Well, somebody whose case falls as a terrorist case may not be charged with anything that touches on terrorism. And the protocol itself lists, and I won't go through them all, but starts with murder. Not terrorist murder, as I've said, murder, manslaughter, and then a number of uh, offences dealing with explosions and the like. It doesn't get to any of the Terrorism Act offences until it gets to the 10th offence that would fall uh, uh, underneath it. So the cases are all tried by a High Court judge uh, and there are various procedures put in place. There's something that... Um, perhaps is an untidy phrase called special measures for witnesses. Uh, so, for example, the armed officers who shot the two in the uh, Rigby trial were given screens so that people can't see who they are and take out acts of retribution against them. Often, and particularly in cases of, for example, uh, 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 domestic uh, um, violence, um, people have a screen and give evidence from behind a screen so they don't have to look at the person they're giving evidence against. Um, it, it, in fact, the women who gave evidence, the two people who worked for Joe Cox, uh, did, 
deliberately did not want a screen. They wanted to be able to look at Thomas Mayer after they'd given their evidence, and they did so. They were um, tried in separate courts. In fact, the um, Rigby trial took place in court two, and the docks in the middle of the court. It has Persmex screens around it that go all the way effectively up to the ceiling. It means that the witnesses coming in, though, have to walk past where the defendant are and have to walk past effectively looking at them when they uh, leave. There was um, one particular witness uh, after um, Adebolajo and Adebolawe had been shot um, and the police officers were tending to them. Um, duct tape, you've probably used it yourselves, is the most effective way of dealing with gunshot wounds. Black duct tape brought out and stuck uh, on the body. The two men on the floor being covered by another armed officer. They've both been attacked. And this middle-aged woman is coming up the road. Stay back, armed police. She wasn't going to be deterred. Decision time. Is she part of what's happened? Should I be shooting her? Well, made the right decision. She simply wanted to walk up and explain to the uh, Adabalawe it was, who in fact had just had his thumb shot off and shot in the stomach, that he, uh, and I won't, um, you're far too sensitive to hear what she actually said, but she thought he rather deserved uh, what he got. Um, and she did, in fact, I couldn't hear it from where I was. It's an interesting setup in court two. So the judge is there, jury there, you're opposite, and the doc's there. And she walked in, gave her evidence, and as I understand it, she walked past the doc on the far side, said something in rather similar terms to the doc. Um, mental health is often raised in cases um, like this. Um, it raised its head in the trial of Adabalawe. He was fit to be tried. Um, mental health can um, be affected by many things. In fact, being shot is one of them. And he got a, a severe infection in his stomach and it made him um, particularly unwell while he was um, in prison. Um, that had two um, effects, really. During the trial, there was an issue raised as to whether he was fit enough um, to carry on. And there's a very um, good um, psychiatrist called Dr. Joseph, who is an extremely blunt instrument, but extremely bright. Uh, and we had about four days of trying to decide whether Adibalawe was fit. Uh, and Dr. Joseph turned to Mr. Justice Sweeney and said, we've been here for four days. He's been sitting in the dock. You could have got on with the trial and had four days of evidence by now. There was some truth, in fact, in what he was saying. He actually pointed out that if he took his medication, he would undoubtedly be fit to stand his trial. And then, quite deliberately, in front of the defendant, said, because, of course, if he's unfit to be tried, he'll have to go to Broadmoor because I'll have to section him. And if he's sectioned, we're then entitled to inject him with the drugs. He will then recover, which is true, and come back and be tried. So it's far better he takes his medication and he's tried. Funny enough, he took his medication. He became a little bit unwell again towards the end of the trial, which was bumping up to Christmas. He obviously wasn't going to give evidence. Adebolaji was going to be the spokesperson. Of course, the prosecution can uh, invite an adverse inference against somebody who doesn't give a trial in their own defence. We uh, simply said that we wouldn't take that point. Frankly, we didn't need to on the evidence. It would simply have prolonged the trial and attracted some sympathy towards him. So we simply didn't invite an adverse inference um, against him. Thomas um, Mayer um, didn't raise any um, issues as to his mental state. Um, he clearly was sane because clearly he had provided a, a report uh, and it had been served on his defence team, but it wasn't relied on. That's a good clue if you know the other side who got an expert report and they don't serve it on you. It doesn't help their purposes. As I said, Odi Bellagio was always going to give evidence. Thomas Mayer was far much too of a coward to go anywhere near the witness box. But despite their brutality, I've mentioned the uh, humanity uh, of uh, um, the women that went and um, 
comforted what was in fact the lifeless body of uh, Lee Rigby. In the Joe Cox case, the two members of her staff um, were cradling her, saying uh, after she'd been attacked to think of her children and try and stay alive. Joe Cox, in fact, had said after she'd been attacked for the first time, he, he didn't quite kill her at the first time, um, that they should simply run away because it was only her that the attacker was after. Extraordinary bravery, you may think. There was a, um, a rugby league player, somebody who played for the local uh, amateur side, was at the top of the road that um, Thomas Mayer was going to go down to escape. He suddenly thought he was coming at him. He was on the phone to the emergency services, but in fact Thomas Mayer had got a sort of planned escape route. He was never going to succeed, but he was wearing two caps, a white hat under a black cap, would go around the corner, take the black cap off, change his clothes as he went. Um, the rugby player just followed him on the mobile phone, dictating what was happening. Uh, and so, in fact, when I called him to give evidence in the trial, he was sworn, I simply stay there, and we played the 999 tape, which simply um, dictated the route as to where he'd been. Um, interestingly, and I'm always amazed what the press report and don't report, but very clearly as he's giving this commentary to the emergency service, police car goes past and you can hear it with the blues and twos flashing and very clearly the young man said run him over quite why it was never in any news report after it I've no idea in fact sometimes um, <coughs> these kind of acts um, bring communities closer together I've already uh, mentioned uh, the 77-year-old man who, who came to try and save Joe Cox. Those that had gathered around uh, Lee Rigby's body being held back um, by uh, the two men um, with their held back um, by the, their weapons, not physically. Um, somebody in the crowd said, bloody immigrants. Somebody else said, they're not all like that. And a black man turned around and said, thank you. And in fact, there was a great galvanising amongst the uh, people of Woolwich who slightly turned against the right-wing people who tried to uh, um, rather hijack uh, the scene. How did the police react? Well, I've already told you about their shooting as they arrived and that first aid um, that was given immediately afterwards. Um, for a time, their reaction was pretty much shown as a, a training video of the fact that you did what you were supposed to do, shot people who were being a threat to life and then tried to save life. How uh, some public acts of terrorism have moved on. You may have seen the clips of Borough Market and how the instructions have changed. Clearly when you have people who have knives taped to their hands who are going to just carry on killing until they're stopped, have to be stopped. And it is, you may think, great bravery for an armed officer who, in that case, got out of a vehicle that was still moving and managed to shoot uh, one of the attackers in the crowd of other people. One uh, lesson learned um, was, though, that the driver uh, of the BMW X5, as it swept in to Artillery Place, um, had her side gun, because if you're driving you can't really carry a carbine, on her right thigh. A completely hopeless place to have it when you've got a little armrest on the door of an X5, not a prospect of being able to get your handgun out while you're driving the vehicle. They now strap them elsewhere. In Burstall, the two officers uh, that managed to get to where uh, um, Thomas Mayer was still had the knife, still had the gun, in fact, in his bag by now, but obviously him, were unarmed. One of them had hung out of the vehicle and told him to stop. He did stop, he turned round, and then when he went for the bag, they didn't wait for backup. They, to put it colloquially, simply dropped him. He cracked his head open on the floor. They, too, again, simply spent the rest of their time patching his head up until another vehicle came to take him away. The sentencing um, remarks by both judges I can take relatively shortly, uh, but um, there was a 
whether pathos is the right word, um, a, a remarkable element to the sentencing of Adebolajo and Adebolawi. High court judges have their sentencing remarks ready. They've prayed, prepared them in advance and the public expect them to be made public as soon as they finish them. So they're typed up, ready to go out uh, on the judiciary website. Well, having introduced the sentencing, uh, Mr Justice Sweeney said, you each converted to Islam some years ago. Thereafter you were radicalised and each became an extremist, espousing a cause and views which, as has been said elsewhere, are a betrayal of Islam and the peaceful Muslim communities who give so much to our country. Well, as soon as he said the word betrayal, again, to use a colloquial phrase, it kicked off in the dock. Um, I think people had worked out that might happen. The prison officers were in immaculately pressed white shirts. There just happened to be about 20 of them in the dock. Uh, and the way to contain people like that is simply to swamp them, so they just moved forward. So the two were um, squashed uh, against the um, perspex screens. The entire dock was shaking. It was an incredibly violent scene, uh, and you could just see this sea of white shirts. You could hear the manacles go on, uh, and the principal officer looked up. Mr Justice Sweeney simply went, and they were taken downstairs. Head first, not, not to hurt them, it's a disorientating uh, method that if you are upside down, you can't fight quite as well as if you are the right way up. And they were removed. Mr Justice Sweeney then turned to me and said, well, Mr Whitton, in, in practical terms, they've absented themselves, so I'm just going to carry on and sentence them and they'll get a transcript. Of course, my Lord. The problem is, of course, he sentencing remarks were about to go out. So he addressed two empty spaces in the dock, saying, and you, Adebolajo, and you, Adebolawe. And after the drama that had just unfolded, it was extremely difficult to keep a straight face, despite the fact that he was going to um, pass down a, a whole life term uh, as far as Adebolajo uh, was concerned, uh, and the minimum term, so a minimum term to be served of 45 years as far as Adebolawe was concerned. Um, he did find, uh, as um, the Terrorism Act 2008 suggests, that it was a murder with a terrorist connection. And therefore, because the law says he should, he made a notification order uh, for 30 years. You might think it's a bit bizarre, because the notification order is you have to say where you're living and restrictions on going abroad. But if you're going to be in prison for the rest of your life, uh, I'm not quite sure um, what purpose that serves. <coughs> Thomas Mayer's sentencing was rather different. He um, had sat in the dock, hadn't raised a defence, had been um, convicted. Uh, he, um, through his counsel, said that he would like to address the court before he was sentenced. Uh, and in a very old-fashioned but perfectly sensible way, uh, Simon Russell Flink stood up when he pointed out that there was um, an application for the defendant to address the court. He finished it by saying, and my Lord, we have no idea what he is going to say. Coded for, you must need your head examining if you're going to let him have free reign, having sat there throughout the trial and have that oxygen of publicity. And the judge uh, said, you have not even had the courage to admit and acknowledge what you did. You have instead forced the prosecution to prove this case in detail, withholding your agreement to anything which would have lessened that task, task, thereby adding, I have no doubt deliberately, to the anguish of the Cox's family and the witnesses to these awful events, forced as they have, have been to relive them. He uh, didn't uh, let him uh, address the court. He too got a whole life term. Again, uh, and I don't need to go through the terms, you can look them up on the website if you want to, but again, because of the supremism, nationalism uh, and association with Nazism in its modern forms. He didn't actually go on um, to make a notification order in that case. We, as the prosecution do in all cases, have provided a note on sentence. In other words, judge, please take these things into account as a matter of law. They served on the defence as well. He 
didn't make any pronouncement, whether he thought it was a waste of time or forgot in the heat of the moment, we don't know. It was one thing that caused a little angst. The Home Office wanted to know why on earth one of their um, acts of Parliament about a notification order hadn't been made. And the press, um, to some extent, leapt on it, saying, oh, is this a distinction? Um, you didn't make a notification order uh, as a terrorist murder in one, and you did in the other. Really, I think, looking for a story. That The press, um, in reporting, um, particularly in cases of this na nature, have a thirst for instant uh, reporting. Um, they want to be able to tweet from the court, send messages out, um, so that things are reported straight away. That uh, occasionally means that there isn't a great deal of judgment uh, as to what they report. They just want to be the first to report it. For example, uh, they will have a copy of my opening note. It has a a health warning on the front saying check against delivery, I might not say everything. Uh, the reason I say that is that not in this case, but another case um, at lunchtime, my junior pointed out that already on a, a local news site were parts of my opening that I hadn't actually got to yet. Um, so uh, they do get uh, a, a little excitable. But they were and continued to say why had these two cases been treated differently? Why had Thomas Mayer not been tried with a terrorist murder? Uh, and however hard the police tried to explain that the offences were identical, um, they couldn't get anywhere. In fact, they had been, apart from that comment I'd made about the sentence, treated absolutely the same way. They'd both been tried at the Old Bailey. They'd both been dealt with under the terrorist protocol, both charged with murder and the subsidiary offences. I was the same leading counsel in both cases. I deliberately used the same introductions that I had in both cases. Both received whole life terms. Is it because um, the press, rather than the lawyers, treat Islamic terrorism differently from white supremacy terrorism? That um, oxygen of publicity is a separate topic, not one that I can deal with in this lecture. But think of the Christchurch massacre in New Zealand. There, the Prime Minister said that she wasn't going to use the name of the perpetrator. And, in fact, the media signed up there to a protocol not to uh, give uh, um, oxygen to that individual. Is that the right thing to do? If the press are excluded or don't report things, they get very upset. I prosecuted Incidal, the terrorist trial that took place mostly in private. And despite Lord Thomas Chief Justice being shocked that a lot of it was in private, and it was certainly the most torrid day I can recall in my uh, advocacy, um, in fact, at the end of it, decided a great deal of it should have been heard in private. Uh, way before your time, um, Margaret Thatcher um, said that uh, I, members of the IRA couldn't be reported uh, on our mainstream media, uh, and they had to have if somebody was interviewed, um, a voiceover. So it wasn't the voice of the individual. Um, the, the way um, the press um, chose to point out quite how stupid that was, was somebody um, did a documentary dealing with a lot of prisoners um, in Northern Ireland, some of whom were, were not members of the IRA, and they could all feature. Uh, there was then, quite deliberately, an interview of a member of the IRA who had to be... Um, blocked out, uh, and have an actor doing the voiceover. The interview was about the size of the sausage rolls in prison. But he was a member of the IRA and therefore couldn't be seen. Uh, in the uh, Bader-Meinhof days, uh, the Red Army faction days, um, the, the Germans tried to restrict any reporting uh, of the kidnappings that were taking place. It didn't really work. Post Christchurch, just to return it for a moment, some of you may know that the 
um, professional rugby side in Christchurch, uh, won uh, the championship many times, are called the Crusaders. They thought um, that they should change their name, certainly get rid of the uh, horseback uh, armed people with a sword. Uh, and it looks as though that may happen. Although, of course, because of the contractual obligations, nothing could happen before the end of the year. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Islamic community in Christchurch said um, they couldn't see any reason whatsoever to change those images. The players had come to see their community after the tragic murders uh, and as far as they were concerned it was simply a marketing ploy and nothing that they thought should change. So I spent a little while not contrasting but saying why the offences are similar. Well they're really only similar because they were people being murdered uh, randomly in public for shocking effect. Lee Rigby was a random target from a specific class of people. Jo Cox was specifically targeted because of her views and her position as an MP. Both Adibalajo and Adibalawe had come to the attention of the security services. Thomas Mayer was completely under the radar. Uh, both the killers of Lee Rigby had sought martyrdom. Clearly, uh, when the two uh, are involved, they need to, sorry, two or more people are involved, they need to have planned together what they are going to do. Uh, without uh, an operative firearm, it might have required two of them to effectively carry out the murder of a soldier in public. The uh, security services describe Adibalajo and Adibalawe as self-starting. Thomas Mayer, was he a lone actor or a self-starter? There's no real intelligence about him, even with hindsight. Where did he get the gun from? It was stolen from a vehicle in Yorkshire, uh, and adapted. He'd searched how to adapt the firearm, but was he really somebody that had the guile to target specifically somewhere to steal a firearm and to uh, adapt it? The uh, reflection by those in authority on what happened was extremely different. Uh, the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament reported on the murder of Fusilier Lee Rigby it's a report which, including the annexes, uh, is nigh on 200 pages long. It's wide-ranging. Again, it's publicly available. It deals with the role of communication service providers, how we manage foreign fighters. Adibalajo had come to their attention in Kenya, had been flagged up on his uh, return. How do the domestic security service, MI5, prioritise their process? How do they identify and assess the subjects of interest? And particularly as far as um, decision-making was concerned, found four missed opportunities as far as Adibalawe was concerned and five missed opportunities as far as Adibalajo was concerned. Um, there was a government response to those findings. Um, it's difficult because the authorities in Kenya dealt with <coughs> Adibalajo when he was detained there. And in fact, it's SIS, so in other words, MI6, that deal with things abroad rather than at home. And it's very difficult to interfere with things that are being dealt with domestically, and authorities were dealing with it. <coughs> I deliberately um, used um, the phrase um, self-starting, because that's how... Um, those two men were described. <coughs> in other words, they had been radicalised, but it was they themselves that then started the acts that they were going to be uh, involved in. Thomas Mayer was subject to um, no such investigation, although RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute for Defence and Security Studies, have written about him. They point out that one of their own studies 
shows that extreme right-wingers constitute a third of lone actor terrorists. And they commented in relation to uh, Thomas Mayer, the conviction in November of neo-Nazi Mayer for Cox's murder, which occurred just a few days before the 23rd of June referendum uh, on the UK's continued membership of the EU, has made apparent the dangerous and multifaceted reality of far right-wing extremism and terrorism. As aspects of the political mood in the UK become more desensitised to anti-immigration arguments, as well as anti-European and anti-Islamic Islamic discourses, it is within these spaces that some feel compelled to transform their political and ideological beliefs into violent extremism. However, the resurgence of the far right is not just a major threat to security. They promote a certain ethno-national identity and an associated politics of memory that is both myopic and inward-looking. And particular to that is the idea of Englishness as an identity tr trumping and surpassing that of Britishness. The form is presented as a distinct ethnic category, whereas the latter is seen as a cultural and legal category. This tendency creates huge obstacles for the promotion of social cohesion and tolerance in society. One lesson that could be learnt from the Joe Cox case was the trial's verdict is on the role of ideology, ideology in processes of radicalisation. In relation to the threat from Islamic ideology is seen as central to violent decision-making processes. However, research suggests that it is more matters less than it is often claimed, and that is more relevant only in the latter stages of transforming a vulnerable young person into a capable terrorist. When it comes to far-right extremism, there is a tendency to underplay the role of ideology. This approach now needs to be altered to reflect recent developments to patterns of violent extremism, increasingly witnessed in Europe and North America in recent periods. For it is vital not to let the necessary attention paid to radical Islamism impede the wider work required to restrict all forms of violent extremism. So before you ask me any questions, I pose for you to consider, not necessarily now, these questions. What's likely to have the greatest impact? Selecting a random target from a larger identifiable group, a soldier such as Lee Rigby, or targeting a specific high-profile individual who espouses a view of belief contrary to the murderers. Would the act of Thomas Mayer in, in murdering Joe Cox have achieved greater notoriety had he escaped, as was his intention? Would Adibalajo and Adibalawe have achieved greater or less notoriety had they succeeded in their apparent aim to be killed? I simply comment. Could you, save for what you have learnt during your studies, identify the three men that carried out the killings at Borough Market. They were shot. There's been an inquest. Are there, do their names trip off your tongue as easily as Adi Bellagio and Adi Balawe? In the New Zealand case, are, are, are white supremacy cases reported differently? Or is it a development in media reporting? Is it the reporting that affects your, the public's, perception of what happened? Or are they different types of offending? I think that's just under the hour. Um, I'm happy to take uh, any questions, either on these two cases or other cases that I may or may not have been involved in.